Hey, what's going on with shipping? Sal Mercagliano here for our third live stream of the week. Uh, started off this week with Jay Mintzmeyer talking about what's going on with stocks. I had hoped to have Bruce Jones on uh, yesterday, didn't come on, but instead we did an hour long Q&A with yours truly. And today what I have is John Conrad to join us. Now I bring John Conrad on for a very good reason. Number one, it's always good video. It's great. It's going to be fantastic to, to, to hear John. But but the, the best thing in here is going to be the fact that uh, John was the very first guest I ever had on this back when we were talking about what was going on in the Suez. So uh, I bring John on every year to talk about our, our year in recap. So let's go ahead and get John on. There he is, John Conrad, my buddy. How are we doing, sir? What's happening, Sal? So, uh, so glad to be here. Man, it's great to have you on here. Always a fun way to end the year to talk about maritime in the last year and what's going forward. Unfortunately, John, 2023 was a pretty quiet year. We we just did not have that many news stories at all <laughs> dealing with the maritime environment. It was just like everything was normal. Everything was quiet and everything has just been trucking along beautifully without an issue and care in the world. Holy crap, John. I, I don't know where we start. I really don't. Because the, the, I'll, the I'll tell you where to start. My favorite, my favorite thing uh, is Sal's Patreon group. Um, <laughs> it's just you know, guys get on there with the chat and get the information early, and then the G Captain forum. Um, I saw Jay Mintzmeyer last time. His Seeking Alpha man. Some of those guys with the stock picks right up in their in their chat is just amazing. And G Captain news you can get before Sal wakes up early morning. We're just about to hit a hundred thousand email subscribers. I, I know we're not at, uh, where, where are you at now with your subs? Uh, I am at just over 170,000, but you are oh, 99,902 yeah. members on the newsletter. So let's see. So let's, maybe let's here put with... that up to a hundred grand this day. I, I got to catch, I got to catch up to Sal here guys. So, uh, <laughs> show some love, go to GCAM, put your email in that subscriber. It's free and, uh, we appreciate it. It's a great way. And uh, let me be clear, the forum, if you've never been on a GCAP forum, number one, you've got guys and women who have been in the industry, they're talking questions and really bringing a lot of key things to bear. And I think it's a great forum to do it. All right. We plugged each other enough here. Let's go ahead and jump into stories and what we want to do. So John, you wanted to talk about your top five stories for the year. So I'm going to sit back, uh, relax, let you kind of kick us off with the first story. And at the same time, too, uh, we've got the chat group open. So if you have questions or anything, feel free to jump them in there. I will tag them. We can come back to them. Uh, and I will link over to, for everybody, the uh, article over in G-Captain that's looking at the maritime stories that made 2023. Uh, and that was done by Mike Schuller, the chief editor over at G-Captain. So, John, take it away, bud. There's so many to pick from Sal, but I think that the uh, number five, number five has to be this Titan submersible, uh, ex you know, explosion. The, uh, they, they put this, uh, some uh, tech guys designed this carbon fiber submersible to go dive down into the depths of the Titanic. And it dominated the news, a big media story for uh, a few days um, you know, there was a lot of question if this thing could be uh, rescued. I, I think you came out and said, when you're at those depths of the Titanic, uh, it's going to be a catastrophic loss. And that's certainly what we saw. Now, I think, you know, on, on one end, is this an important story? Not really from the uh, perspective of the maritime shipping. It doesn't have waves of, you know, th these were a couple of billionaires who took some risks and really tried something new. And, and we should kind of encourage the uh, pushing of boundaries. Uh, you know, all this, all this money gets poured into uh, rockets, but the unexplored depths uh, are um, just as mysterious to us now as, as some of our own solar system. So I think, you know, people were really excited about this to kind of explore those depths. And unfortunately, these people took unnecessary risks. But I think the broader story, the really interesting story is the underfunding of maritime technology. Um, we, we, we've seen some, you know, we haven't seen investments in the shipping, in the depths, in 
you know, dirty ships like container ships and uh, bulk carriers and dirty oil tankers, offshore drill ships like the ones I used to uh, work work on board. And um, I, I think that this is a big reason why, um, you know, we're seeing these major uh, catastrophic uh, waterfall effects on our supply chain. You know, what people are missing here is, you know, we still don't have a maritime focus. Uh, Biden, first day of administration, took uh, the Trump's maritime desk in the National Security Council and closed it. Um, we had three ship owners in the original uh, Trump cabinet, in the, you know, and don't don't want to give too much to Trump. This isn't a political um, show, but you know they tripped up a lot in the final years of the Trump administration. But we come into the Biden administration, and there's very little focus on shipping, a uh, very little focus on shipping from you know the the tech bros in Silicon Valley. Uh, we have one real uh, amazing tech story, and that's Flexport. Our friends. Uh, uh, Ryan Peterson and uh, their, their maritime head, Nathan Strang, follow them on Twitter. But this lack of focus from policy-wise and the lack of investment from the technology sector has really uh, led to shipping being behind. So when we have these incidents like the Red Sea, when we have these incidents um, like the port congestion, which ignited uh, inflation, um, you know, there isn't very much good data in there. There aren't, you know, we've been, the, the Navy, uh, previous CNO promised autonomous ships day one. And now four years later, he's out. The Navy does have some autonomous shipping capability. Um, but, you know, where are these autonomous ships in the Red Sea where we have this amazing, uh, you know, new rocket uh, that Elon Musk, you know, the, the, the biggest aerospace Thing ever to fly. And we, we just don't have that technology in the maritime sector. And even when you do like this Titan sub, you know, guys, guys cut corners, guys push the boundaries, make mistakes. Then we have an epic failure. And the, the real, um, you know, the real impact here is that, that money, that flow of venture capital money, the flow of, um, uh, you know, White House and Senate and it, interest in the maritime domain, people people take a step further back. And I don't think we can take in a, a further step back from the maritime domain without falling off the cliff behind us. What do you think, Sal? No, I, I think I think you're right. I, you know, first off, I, I think the story uh, about the Titan did captivate a lot of people. It had everything. It had Titanic. It had a rich billionaire, millionaire. Uh, it, it had loss of life. Uh, for me, I know in my channel, it was huge. I mean, that was a story that kept on going for a long time. I talked about yesterday. That was the moment I got over 100,000 subscribers, and I really didn't want to talk about that at the time over the death of five people because I thought it was very tragic at the moment. But I do think the technology issue is such a big one. I, I think we're talking about technology all the time. And, and, and you know, there are times what, what got me about the Titan incident was we had never had a death at depth in a submersible until that point for over 60 years. I mean, it was one of the safest industries there was. And then you saw this new technology come in with everyone second guessed and, and thought afterwards is like, this is really bad. And a lot of people did say it was bad, but they didn't say it loud enough. And there was no one really to go to, to stop them from doing what they were doing. And so that technology was allowed to operate for three years. And we saw it fail catastrophically. Like we said, it was either either they're going to be found on the bottom with a with a propulsion issue, or they were going to be imploded, and it was going to be not very nice. So yeah, I, I do think technology is is the big driving factor. And as you mentioned before, I think propulsion, I think the issue of climate change, and all those issues are going to be really manifesting themselves. And so when you get something like Titanic and, and Titan in this. This is a huge kind of story because it involves almost everything coming together here in a few ways. So I, I, I think uh, it, it's a good one. So I, I, I agree with you on that. 
Uh, again, some great comments. Keep feeding the questions in. However, Brett, we will not be going to uh, talking about airships in this in this video today. So there there'll be no airship conversations at all in here. There's there, there's there's a subgroup. Not, not with one, it. not one. Even the even Reed's no. Uh, no. privateer uh, airship. Did that no. Not a little no, 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 we're not. We, we talk about we talk about shipping, not airships, in here for a good, very, very good reason. All right, John, do you want to go ahead and broach into your second topic here? Are you are you jumping in with any here, Sal? Or uh, no, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna have you run. I'm gonna have you run. I'm gonna just uh, let you do your top five because I want to I want to comment on the side here on this so we can keep it within an hour. If you and I go together, we'll be here for for three hours. So <laughs> so uh, I'm trying to keep it manageable today. Well, I know this one is dear, close and dear to your heart, and uh, it, it kind of checks a few boxes, but the number of ship fires, um, you know, I, it wasn't this year, but the previous year we had the Bonham Richard fire. I think that was in last year's uh, top 10 biggest stories. Uh, that really should have been a wake-up call that ports and harbors invest in uh, fire boats and maritime specialists in the ports uh, who can understand uh, ship fires and the growing uh, disasters that are, are around ship fires. But, you know, many months have passed and San Diego still does not have a proper fire boat. There's also a lack of Navy salvage, uh, dedicated salvage uh, ships and assets in the port of San Diego, which has over a hundred billion dollars worth of equipment there. And, you know, we were hoping that the Navy would take the lead, uh, that Marad would potentially reopen. Uh, they used to have a uh, firefighting uh, school up in the Great Lakes where they taught local fire departments how to interact with the Navy and interact with uh, shipboard uh, fires. But very little happened. And then we started having this flood of uh, car ship fires. Some of them, um, you know, the big debate is which one of these were started by EVs. Once an you know, uh, EV catches fire, um, it's very hard to put out because it's that class D fire. And it re requires specialized tools and specialized equipment. Sometimes these uh, car fires are not started by EVs. They're started by a leak of gasoline or by other means. But once they catch on to the EVs, uh, once those EVs that are nearby start uh, catching fire, it's almost impossible uh, to put out. And we've, you know, lots of crazy ideas on Twitter that, that Sal, Sal's great at answering those questions. You know, uh, the, the worst idea, I think, was why don't you just jettison these EVs? Because and you can't because if you go inside of these car carriers, these row rows, roll on, roll off uh, ship carriers, um, they are packed in tight. Uh, there, there's no driveway in the metal like a parking garage. The, sh the cars are, you know, row upon row, really close together, and they are lashed down. A ship like this only has 24 people. And you need engineers in the engine room. You need the bridge team uh, kind of command and control of the situation. So there may only be a half dozen people who can go in and battle this fire on a ship. Um, very few options to really help them out. And then, you know, sadly, sadly, we had um, a car carrier in the port of uh, Newark, um, Port Authority, uh, ship terminal in Newark, catch fire. Uh, in New York City has some of the best fire boats in the world. My my dad worked on as a fireman, worked uh, temporary shifts on one of them. But uh, by the time those were called, uh, the Newark Fire Department had already uh, lost uh, two firefighters. Um, very sad. Uh, and we had, you and I had talked at a Navy League conference a few months before with a few Newark firefighters who were at the Navy League begging the Navy uh, for help in, in training in the specialized equipment in uh, all the things that can help these ports battle the fire. And their specific concern was how do we put out these um, fires that, that may have dozens or even hundreds of electric 
EVs that they don't know how to put out. But you're you're the uh, fire captain, Sal, and the the expert. What is your thoughts? No, I, I think the uh, shipboard fires that we've seen. I mean, Frame, Fremantle Highway being uh, the one that uh, I was showing just a little while ago there, and then of course Costa Grand uh, Grand Costa Devorio out in New Jersey that cost the lives of two. Newark firefighters, uh, you know, just like you, uh, right after that event in Newark, I was doing Zoom calls with firehouses in and around the port, talking about what you should be thinking about going in. And let me be clear, the Newark Fire Department was not given the resources they needed to properly prepare how to fight a fire. And a shipboard fire is not a structure fire. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a land fire. I've been a land firefighter for 20 something years. And before that I was a firefighter on ships because all mariners are firefighters and it is two different beasts and EVs pose a big issue. Now let me be clear about EVs because everyone loves to jump on this. EVs tend not to cause the fires. The problem is the internal combustion engines. But when you have EVs on board and the fire gets to an EV, they're almost impossible to put out. And that's the problem you have is compatibility of the cargo together. You know, we have dealt with this in the shipping industry for a long time with compatibility of cargo. We have lists of things that you don't store next to each other. And we've got to get away from storing EVs next to internal combustion engine cars. I was just asked this the other day about what can be done in the short term to fix this problem. And, and understand when an EV catches fire, you can't put it out. I mean, you just, you can drop it in the ocean. It's still going to keep burning because it's self-oxidizing. It's going to create its own oxygen to burn. The best thing you can do is create compartmentalization and separation of the cargo so that at least if you have internal combustion engine fires, you can try to suppress that. You can do that with CO2. You can do that with, with, with foam and, and, and seawater. But once the EV start burning, it gets out of control. One of the things with Fremantle Highway was the fact that it had an empty deck. It had the, the number five deck was empty and it created a fire break. It's what saved that vessel from being a true total loss. What it was, uh, um, Grand Costa Devorio was used cars. The fact that we were hauling used cars up and there was very little regulation on not the used cars themselves, because there's very little regulation about those but even less regulation about the pusher cars that were being used on board. So again, we have to take a look at the safety in ports. And I am, you know, you know, nothing gets me more fired friggin' up than the Bonham Richard fire, because that was a needless waste. Uh, that fire was in June, uh, June or July of 2020, but the report came out the past year or two. And, you know, I've read that Jagman investigation. I've done multiple videos on it and nothing has gotten me more mad then reading that report and sitting there saying, this is the stupidest freaking thing I've ever read and then turn the page and nope, here it is. This is even dumber. I mean, it was just a, a, a loss of a ship in port. That's ridiculous. And you know, the fast forward to the modern day, have we fixed it? No. If we have a fire tomorrow in a U.S. Navy port, there is not the provisions I think in place to help prevent it because the fire boat isn't the issue. It's not how much water it shoots, which is a, shitload of water. Let me be clear about that. A lot more than San Diego little fire boats from the police department do, but it's the trained personnel. You and I both know crews in LA and Long Beach every day on those fire boats are looking at what ships are coming in each day. They're prepping and working through. If we have a fire on this ship, this is how we're going to go about dealing with it. And this is how we want the responding engine crews. They provide that command and control and what we call in firefighting, the ICS, the, you know, the, 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 the control system in place so that you can have an integrated con command system and you can be able to seamlessly integrate in forces and fight a fire. And one of the things that I'm looking at right now in the Red Sea is where's the tugs and fire salvage ships that should be in place there should a ship get seriously hit and have to be pulled out of the area. I think that's an important one. And I, I think we don't tend a lot. We've seen some great stories and some great saves I think up in Vancouver, Washington, when we had this, uh, the Zim uh, come in there, I forget which uh, Zim ship, ship it was, but they were able to get that fire out. Fortunately, they had two large Maersk offshore vessels that were in place there. So you're right. I, I think uh, uh, life safety is always a big issue. And I, I don't think we're taking it seriously enough. I don't think the U.S. Navy is taking it seriously enough to the point that they have decommissioned and taken out of service nearly every fleet salvage vessel they have. And the new ones, which are being built, which are fantastic boats, the Navajo class, they're great, but we don't have the first one yet. 
And this is what the Navy tends to do. We get rid of a platform and then we replace it with another platform, but that platform's not here yet. So you know, it, it just seems to be they get ahead of their, you know, they get over the tips of their skis, so to speak. And, and I uh, agree. I, you know, I think those fire boats are amazing capabilities because they have all the equipment there and it's not about shooting the, the ships. It's about being able to plug in to the fire mains and give more host pressure to the firefighters. But the real thing is those fire boat crews, they eat, breathe, sleep. They think about when they're, you know, having coffee in the morning, they're talking about the different ships uh, come in, they're reading ship manuals. It's that ship expertise. Um, and, and we saw, you know, in the Navy, when the, when the Pearl Harbor happened, um, we sent some of those local firefighters um, to the Red Sea. Um, Under the Red Sea Sun uh, is, is a book all about the salvage operations in the Red Sea. So we need those fire teams with the training and ship that we can pull into uh, to help the military during times like this in the Red Sea, or if there is a, a larger war. But also part of the story is these railroads are really, really difficult uh, to, to, to salvage. We had the Zim Kingston with the Canadian Coast Guard did an amazing job because they had these large offshore supply vessel uh, cutters that were able, with the expertise on to put that fire out. I'm not sure they would have done so well if it was a row row a vessel and the bigger problem here is as you keep pointing out sal with our ready reserve fleet uh this is what the u.s maritime administration marad is buying to put all our bring all our army gear overseas um and these ships are in intrinsically unstable uh if they catch the bottom like we saw in georgia they could take years to get that equipment off and salvage if there's a minor fire from a missile strike that can spread and combine that with the army's desire to uh make all of their support vehicles uh ev i mean where this is a, this is a dangerous dangerous combination especially without that expertise in our port firefighting and uh, without the fire boat expertise in the navy yeah, I, I think it's, again, it, it's, you know, the Bonhomme Richard, it was an interesting case. The ship had just come out of the shipyard. It still had a Navy crew on board and it was, it was a breakdown in command. It really was. And, and it was, it, it, it's not meant to degrade at all Navy firefighters. That's not the issue at play. The issue at play was, you know, this is when ships are the most dangerous in port. It's coming out of port and in port on normal routines. And unfortunately, you know, a fireboat gives you a lot of utility. It allows you to lay lines into the fire, to, to charge the ship's uh, fire main system without the ship being online. Uh, it gives you everything you need right there, uh, right alongside, and it can do a, a, a variety of things. Again, it's not just spraying a lot of water. That's, that, that's not the issue, and that's unfortunately what a lot of people who don't know about fu marine firefighting tend to think it is. All right, John, well, we've hit two out of the five so far, so let's go ahead and jump over to uh, number three for you. I think number three is going to be a, a combination of stories from that article. It is both uh, Russia's shadow fleet and and uh, the grain Black Sea grain exports um, are really tied together because they are so closely associated with the Ukraine war. We didn't have time to really uh, put this in the uh, the you know article because we already had two Russian uh, stories, but also you know the Ukraine Navy's uh, ability without any warships to uh, sink uh, Russian warships. We had the uh, Moskva was the big uh, ship that, that got sunk, the flagship of the Black Sea. And just uh, this week, we've had a large amphibious assault ship uh, ca <coughs> catch, <coughs> excuse me, Sal, catch uh, fire. So this, this, is, this is war. This is war in the Black Sea. And a uh, big part of this is the Navy, for various reasons, has not been able to um, send U.S. Navy warships into the Black Sea. So um, we've also not done a very good job, I believe, in sending, um, you know, spare warships, sending mine clearance equipment 
to the NATO allies in the Black Sea, which is Romania, Bulgaria, and Turkey. There has been some attempts uh, for the last few months for a Turkish-led mine-clearing expedition to go into the Red Sea and clear these mines. You know, I'm just watching uh, The Crown. The new season of The Crown is on Netflix. My, my wife loves that show. And uh, this week they're talking about Princess Diana, you know, going in and having the landmine campaign and all the work she did to band and, and be able to clear landmines. Well, uh, you know, that momentum has not really reached the uh, sea mines in the Black Sea. People don't realize the number that are there. There's a picture on uh, this this latest strike, which is the, just this week, um, of a green ship in the Black Sea. And we have a picture on G-Captain of uh, signs all over Black Sea beaches telling kids don't, don't, don't send women in the water. Uh, it's not because of sharks or, or dangerous tides or anything else. It's because these mines are floating up on the, the beach. And this is a bigger story in the context of the Ukraine war because the uh, first and second largest providers in grain in the world are Ukraine and Russia. Ukraine has been able, you know, doing an amazing job of uh, getting grain down the Danube, getting grain into Romanian ports where it can be exported. But it's just a tiny percentage of the grain they were able to get out previously. And then look at the um, Russian uh Grain is really coming down all of the inland rivers of, of Russia and the entire Caspian Sea go through uh, the Kerch Strait and under that Kerch Strait bridge. And this is a, a, a this is the focal point of the war. All of the stories uh, in the major media talk about the land offensive. Look where the land offensive is. It's close to Mariupol because the last time the Ukrainians had Mariupol, they were able to shell all this immense amount of grain and other supplies that are coming uh, through the Sea of Azov and the Kerch Strait. So Ukraine wants to make a breakthrough in order to stop that shipping. And Russia pulled out of the uh, Ukraine grain deal. Meanwhile, we had all of the sanctions on Russian oil. Uh, we really came in in the beginning of the war and closed down Russia's access to banks and payments. And then we started putting sanctions and price caps on the Russian uh, oil, um, restricting their ability to get insurance and put this oil in the Black Sea uh, on ships to export. Uh, but, you know, uh, where there's a will, there's a way in the shadowy, smoke-filled rooms of the shipping industry. So uh, a lot of the good-named uh, tanker companies sold off their old, rusted, uh, beaten-up ships, and unknowingly, uh, in most cases, some cases knowingly, sold that off to um, owners who have uh, bypassed the insurance and, and regulatory markets. Uh, they're playing with uh, jamming AIS uh, ship tracking signals and doing a whole host of unsavory tactics in order to get this Russian oil out. And the, the, the biggest buyer is China, uh, followed by India. So this ties into uh, the Red Sea story too, Sal, because um, while Maersk and uh, CMA CGM and MSC and the big container lines have uh, rerouted around the hostilities of the Red Sea, these shadow fleet tankers are, are still going right through the war zone. One of those gets hit. Uh, it could be a major oil spill in the Red Sea and not just the Red Sea because these uh, tankers are, uh, you know, unregulated, underinsured. Um, Liberia did the amazing thing of deflagging. A lot of these ships were Liberia. Liberia stepped in and working for a year. This is for a flag of convenience. Amazing step to deflag these shadow fleets but they're still moving in and they're getting up next to uh, other tankers uh, in beautiful coastlines off Greece, off India, off uh, in, in Asia and transferring these oils um, 
which which is an environmental disaster waiting to happen one but two it's funding the the mines and ukraine invasion and the weapons that are going into into russia one final comment is we've seen uh, russia has run out of munitions well a lot of those munitions are coming in from North Korea. They're coming in from other nations, uh, Iran and some from China. We don't know exactly who, but those are all coming through um, the Turkish Straits uh, into the Black Sea on merchant ships, which aren't restricted from coming through. While Turkey has remained, uh, you know, steadfast, uh, they don't want warships to go in there, even if these warships are protecting merchant ships. So while the Navy's doing, uh, you know, every effort possible to protect these ships in the Red Sea, uh, we, we can't get Navy ships and assets into the Black Sea because Turkey won't let us. And it also shows that, we, you know, look how much the USS Kearney is doing in the Red Sea and all the air power advocates have been telling you and I that all of this protection of ships can be done from the air. Well, we can see from the Black Sea when you don't have a naval asset, we have overflight and, and we have Air Force bases in Romania and we're not able to protect those ships with with aircraft alone. And in the Red Sea, where the USS Kearney is really the star of the show, you know, the, the Air Force has taken a back seat. So these naval assets are important. And it's such a big story, all that's going on with Russia uh, together. Uh, singularly, not the number one story, but if you really tie all of these stories together, it's probably still the, the top story of 2023. No, I, I think I think your discussion about the black. I mean, we have talked about the Black Sea, you and I, for a while, and and gotten a lot of friggin' flack for it all the time. That's and, an understatement, Sal. I, I, mean, I know. You, were, I, you and I were the first to say send destroyers in, and and we got hell. And I know for that comments. But but I mean the comment. I mean I got to say that you know the Houthi sitting on the Red Sea are watching what the Ukrainians are doing on the Black Sea. I mean the the Ukrainians don't have a navy. Uh, and and they have been able to push back the Russian Navy and actually threaten their their uh, economy by attacking key areas, the Kerch Strait Bridge. Even this LST that was hit recently was po potentially carrying ammunition, was an ammunition hauler, was a logistics ship. And we've seen the Ukrainians go against logistics ships, hitting the ports. And, you know, you and I have both talked about the fact that the key thing in Russia was the overland route connecting Crimea to Russia. Not so much so you can drive from Crimea to Russia. You can already do that across the Kerch Strait Bridge. It's to secure the Sea of Azov, this little kind of, you know, little ear of Mickey Mouse up here that connects to, to, to into the uh, uh, the Don River and the inland waterways. And I, I got to say, the Houthi are sitting there watching this and sitting there saying, well, if the Ukrainians can do this with some missiles and some unmanned vessel and unmanned uh, surface vessels and, and drones, we could do this against commercial vessels. And, and I think what you see happening in the Black Sea, what you see happening in the Red Sea is, God forbid, it happens in the Yellow Sea or or in the East Asia, you know, in the East China Sea. Uh, that's that's the day or South China Sea. This is where it really starts to be waking people up because th this is an escalation of maritime warfare. The reason I wanted Bruce Jones on yesterday was because Bruce talks about that. He talks about the fact that we're getting back to potentially nationalizing the oceans and and really you know not having the freedom of the seas that we once had. And I think your point about, I started off with the image of the Pablo blowing up off the coast of Malaysia. That is a horrific story for a variety of reasons, not the least of which that ship probably hasn't been in port in a year should not have been operating, probably operating without an inert gas system that removes the explosive vapors from within the ship. Because when you watch that video of the ship exploding, it, it is a it, it's an explosive vapor explosion. It's what you had. It's, it's they did not inert the atmosphere in those hulls. And this is something that was happening in the 1960s and 70s before they mandated inert gas systems to prevent tankers from exploding. And you're seeing it again here because of ship to ship transfers taking place. You're exactly right. You have Russian tankers coming out of the Baltic and the Black Sea, which are very shallow seas. And so you're taking small tankers out, you're bringing them into areas off of Spain, off of, off of uh, Greece, loading them into larger tankers, and then running them through the Suez and the Bab el Mandeb to India, to China, which today they're doing fine, by the way, because the Russian tankers are able to get through there, although we do see tankers being hit. 
And so I do think the Russian story is is a key one. And, and this mining just the other day off the Danube is another important one because the mine was probably ripped up by the storms that ripped through there. It, it more than likely was a Ukrainian mine. But the point is the mine is endangering commercial vessels. And one of the things we've advocated is allow NATO's mine countermeasure groups to go up in the Black Sea. The, the Turks control the straits. We got it. Montreux Convention. Know it. Got it. But they can allow passage through. The, the Turks can allow anybody to go through they want. And minesweepers are not combatant warships. They, they are, you know, they are basically defensive. And we can set up a defensive zone off the coast of Romania and Bulgaria to make sure that ships are sailing safely. And we're not. And, and we basically abrogated that. And now what we're seeing is a fight in the Red Sea over 15% of the world's ships. And, and I think you're right. I, I think it all stems from what we saw start in February of 2022, escalate onto the Black Sea. And now you have this image where you have ships flowing out of, the, out of uh, Russia. This is the lifeblood of Russia over here. All these ships coming out. Meanwhile, over here, you just have a trickle coming out of Ukraine and you're seeing that interdiction. And, and that's, this is what the Houthi are doing right now to the world, what the Russians are doing to the Ukrainians, the, the, the Houthi are, are, are doing in many ways to the world. I don't, I don't know if you, if you agree with that or not, but that, that's, Oh, I that agree fully. You know, when I, I worked on uh, tankers uh, early in my career and then I worked my way up on drill ships and up to captain on, on drill ships, some of the most technologically advanced ships in the deep water. And, you know, when I said where there's a will, there is a way, you know, there's always shadowy operators who are willing to make a quick buck and bypass regulations and get around this stuff. But the oil majors are not uh, willing to take these risks. And we saw with the Red Sea that BP um, is rerouting its vessels. And that's a huge competitive loss and, and really a good thing that they're doing this because on the tanker, you know, the rule number one was no, no smoking on deck. Right. And now you have Houthi missiles landing on, you have mines around uh, tankers. Uh, it's an explosive environment. And if you don't have those systems like the inert gas inspected by the regulators and really put into action, um, it's a dangerous situation. That, that oil will flow on the tankers, but the oil majors are really about exploring for oil and increasing the sources. And I can tell you from projects around the world, um, it's slowly starting, you know, you see the, the, the price of uh, when a, a sea drill and Transocean and Valeris go up, uh, they're, they're bringing in these drill ships, but it's really to compensate from where they, they used to go in Nigeria. They used to go into the Persian Gulf. They used to go into the Black Sea to drill. And they're really retreating uh, from uh, these areas. And these sources of oil um, are going away. So while the U.S. Gulf of Mexico and shale drilling is, is increasing, uh, you know, the oil majors are shutting down in a lot of these projects. And I want to ask you one more thing, Sal, because I think the, the – Probably the probably the biggest story, I think, from the Russian that doesn't get much coverage is this drone warfare. What Ukraine has been able to do with both surface drones and aerial drones. We see with the with the Houthis that they are using low-cost drones. Um, I even heard unconfirmed reports with a VHF radio tied over it, where they could take these low-cost drones drones, pretend they're the uh, Navy or Port Authority, get the ships to stop in the Red Sea. Then with the drones uh, hovering over, they can get a lot along and use that to position their uh, dumb weapons and attack these ships. When we have drones coming from multiple directions, it's, it's difficult to shoot down these drones. Um, a lot of this is, you know, uh, Houthis looking at what Ukraine is doing and really going out, extending beyond the envelope of normal warfare and really um, rewriting uh, the rules. And our ships are doing a great job of it. You know, no one's doing a social engineering attack with a, uh, you know, you know, with, with a VHF radio duct tape to a drone against a U.S. Navy destroyer. And the U.S. Navy destroyer is defeating these. The Carney is shooting down drones left and right. And now the USS Mason, we're well prepared 
but do we have enough of those amazing ships to, to really cover it? And our cheaper ships like the um, uh, LCS is does, doesn't have the air defense. It wasn't designed against these drone threats. So what, what's your thought on this, this drone uh, stuff I, lessons learned from the Black Sea? I'll actually flip it on its ear a little bit with you, John, because I actually think it's the Houthi that are influencing the Ukrainians in a way. Because if you go back to 2000, when the Houthi, or, or it wasn't the Houthi at the time, but it was Yemen, used, uh, it was Al-Qaeda at the time, hit the USS Coal in Aden. They used a, a boat. We had a crew on board and nearly blew the ship up. Uh, and almost sunk the coal in Aden. And then years later, you have an attack by a surface vessel, uh, unmanned surface vessel that, that hit a, a uh, Saudi Arabian frigate right in the Bab el-Mandab. So in many ways, we've seen this escalation. You can go to the Armenia and Azerbaijani war and see the use of drones. We've seen them being escalated use throughout this time. It is just, once you go to full war like Ukraine is, they use all, all the stops are off and they start using everything in their power to use it. So I, I think we're just seeing that develop more and more. All right, John, we're being told by Dave old boy 54, we need to move on. So I'm going to listen to my uh, subscribers here and move on to our next subject. So uh, you want to jump onto your fourth story? Right. That, and, and we're going it's to importance. So the number two most important uh, story of the year, I, you know, they, they, I probably shouldn't talk about this. I'm going to get myself in trouble, uh, Sal. So we'll, we'll tread lightly here. But um, well, he heaven forbid we do that, John. We we never want to cause controversy, you and I. So we because we, <laughs> we we try to stay away from it as much as we can. Hello, everybody on Twitter. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, a few ship owners might not agree with it with you uh, this week, Sal. But uh, but we, you, we've heard from the senior Navy officials. A few. Uh, a few. I hope it's shot. more. Than, I hope it's more than a few. I, I think I'm. I think I think Maersk has got my face up on a bulletin board somewhere with darts in it in Copenhagen. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah, we we Sal and I both received a few phone calls from that individual. But uh, uh, you know, I, I these the big story here and the one on the um, G Captain you know, as top 10 stories of the year is South China Sea confrontations, how aggressive China is really getting to uh, uh, the, the Philippines. Um, and this is specifically about the Sierra Madre. So, uh, you know, when UNCLAWS, the UN Convention of the Sea came out, there were strict rules of what is a territorial water. So that's uh, 12 miles out. And then this EEZ, what what is the economic exclusion zone of various territories? And it was very clear that, uh, you know, the, the Philippine EEZ will belong to the Philippines. And then 10 years ago, um, G Captain wrote about it extensively. A, a few other people like uh, Commander Salamander was uh, on uh, Midrats podcast was really talking about this. Um, but very few were about China's uh, island building. Campaign, so they say dredged up. Uh, they, they dredged up sand basically and built islands in the South China Sea where there weren't ones before. And at first, so they said, "Well, these are just safety outposts for um, you know fishermen and stuff. They're not a military use." And then they built runways on this, and they were like, "Well, that's for emergency landing of." Uh, aircraft in case of an emergency. And then they full out militarized this. We saw this with the Chinese Coast Guard when the Chinese Coast Guard was first being built up. They said, hey, this is, uh, you know, these are unarmed ships. Um, these are just peaceful Coast Guard. We're going to rescue people. We're going to save people. And then very quickly, they started dropping de deck guns and other military equipment on these uh, Coast Guard ships. We've seen the expansion of the maritime uh, militia and the most concerning of all, Sal, we have seen the militarization of the Chinese uh, seafarers. So they are giving military uh, weapons, military communications training to uh, seafarers, commercial seafarers. Um, right now, those seafarers aren't doing anything aggressive with it, but what happens when these seafarers are armed? What happens when a seafarer is given a javelin missile and as the ship is passing by a Navy warship in uh, the Malacca Strait, um, a seafarer jumps out with this? What happens when a, a merchant ship 
you know, launches a swarm of drones. We just saw the attack uh, off right off the EEZ of India of uh, the Pluto chem a chemical tanker. So this isn't even oil. This is carrying chemicals, hazardous chemicals got hit by a drone. Some think I've seen reports that the Houthis shot this drone. Did it come from Iran? Iran drones have the, the range to get 200 miles offshore, but a more realistic, and even if it's proven untrue, possibility is that these drones were launched from uh, either the Chinese or Iranian or other nation fishing boats that are in the area. So, the South China Sea, it, it seems small with, um, you know, so going back to, to this story, the Philippines could not, did not have the money to buy these big dredges and build islands. So they took a old uh, U.S. Navy ship and they ran it up on the rocks and they've had a Marine detachment on there. And these guys need to be supplied with food and water. And every time the Chinese, tr you know, the Filipinos try to resupply this vessel, the Chinese Coast Guard comes out and says, oh, they're operating dangerously. They got all these excuses in the book. And they say they are warding them off with fire hoses. But these aren't fire hoses that are, you, you won't see these fire cannons on a U.S. Coast Guard cutter. I mean, these are not fire cannons to put out ship fires. These are fire cannons for crowd control and um the de destruction of property and equipment. But the broader story, if we step back here, is just this, these lies that the Chinese Navy and China itself are perpetrating everywhere. We see in the Red Sea right now, uh, China did not join uh, the, the U.S. Navy coalition, um, but China has a Navy base in Djibouti. They brought warships into the Red Sea and they're not protecting uh, ships. They're not even protecting their own ships. One of the MERS ships was Hong Kong flag. They're sitting there and watching what's going on. Uh, they're collecting a lot of intelligence um, about the capabilities of the Kearney, what can be shot down and what can't. Because the Houthis are shooting various types. It's not just drones. It's anti-ship uh, ballistic missiles. It's dumb missiles. Uh, and all of these, you know, China is watching what the Carney is doing and seeing what gets through the net and what does not. Huge intelligence uh, network. And then China releases two days ago a video saying, uh, if you're in distress at sea, Call the Chinese Navy at Channel 16. We'll we'll come and <laughs> we'll come and help you. So, so just the 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 boldness of the propaganda and lies. You know, we know the Houthi are backed by Iran. We don't. There, there, there's no evidence that China is backing the Houthi or anything else. But we know Iran's number one backer, the number one import of Chinese of of goods, the supplier of cash to Iran is China. We know that this shadow fleet oil is going to China and they're getting huge discounts off the price of oil. And they're giving cash to uh, Russia, which is being used to buy weapons in the war. We know that North Korea uh, can't, can't take action without Chinese approval, yet they're sending all these weapons to, to, to Russia to fight in Ukraine. Meanwhile, China is saying, you know, we're, we're, we're not, we're not, we're not taking action here. Fast forward to this mind blowingly frustrating, um, summit in San Francisco as all Americans have been told the homeless problem in San Francisco is beyond repair. There's nothing you could do. The murder rate, these, uh, you know, all of the shoplifting and theft that's happened. There's no way to fix it. It's too difficult to fix. Chairman G comes in and within a couple days, all the homeless disappear. The streets are clean. They're safe. Chairman G comes in. We ask him for, you know, climate, help in the climate. We ask him for help in Israel. And it just came out that he straight up told uh, President Biden that the plans to take Taiwan are very much uh, still on the table. Um, so, so they're lying about all this other stuff and really deep in the maritime domain with, with taking over of ports. We saw them take over, uh, uh, 
ports in Hamburg where some of our military, U.S. military supplies come in for U.S. bases. And they, they say, well, that's just commercial. They're saying, well, this is just Coast Guard peaceful things in the South China Sea. They say that China is helping uh, rescue mariners, if you call on Channel 16, which is demonstrably false, uh, just pushing these lies out on the maritime community. Meanwhile, <laughs> they're straight up telling uh, President Biden that, that you know they are going to take Taiwan. Hopefully, or they hope, that it's by peaceful means, but if not, by force. So, well, you know, who do you believe here? What What's the story? What do you think, uh, uh, Sal? Well, I, I think the South China Sea and, and China in its efforts confronting the Philippines is an issue to be looking for. Because, again, the South China Sea, much like the Bab el Mandeb and the Black Sea and the Turkish Straits and the Suez, is a key maritime choke point. The chart I put up here for marine traffic is Chinese fishing vessels, just where Chinese fishing vessels are located. And obviously you see them off the coast of China, but more importantly, you see them in clumps in the Arabian Sea, for example, down in and around the Indian Ocean, around Diego Garcia. You see them in the South Pacific. You see them everywhere. I mean, literally everywhere in the South Atlantic, uh, all over the place, around the, the Falkland Islands, for example. You just see them everywhere. And that's the presence of China these days. Sorry. And if China is doing what... Uh, uh, you're talking about militarizing the, the, the military they have they, or the maritime. They have consumed Alfred Thayer Mahan. Uh, they realize that sea power is two legs. It's the commercial and it's the military side. And uh, they've been very good on that. The U.S. is learning that lesson, unfortunately, again, that, you know, it is commercial and the military. They're using the Navy right now for the purpose it was originally created for back in 1794 to protect trade. And so, you know, this this competition for trade is really important. We're seeing the commercial sector playing a vital role in it. And when you have these distract, these interdictions and you start sending ships around Africa, that's going to lead to inflation. It's going to lead to shortages. It has an economic influence. And, you know, great power competition isn't always military. It's economic. It's, 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 and what's different in this confrontation between the U.S. and China versus U.S. and the Soviet Union is the U.S. and Soviet Union were separate economic systems. We were completely detached. There was no interaction with us. Today, we're, it, we're, we're, we're combined. It's, it's one big world economy. And so I think that is the big danger that we see. All right, John, we're getting out of time. So I want to make sure we, we get to the last story. In, uh, time for and just really questions. clear, just a quick question for you. Everyone, everyone tells me because we're so intertwined, there's no possibility of war. What, what do you think on that? I think that's bull. I, th I, th I think Russian trains were crossing into Germany hours before Operation Barbarossa kicked off in June of 1941. There, th there's always the potential. The problem is, what does a nation like China foresee the economic impact of a conflict being? They're, they're stockpiling uh, resources. Uh, they're building multiple routes through the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, they have multiple sources to get trade with. Uh, and And Again, do we stop ships sailing to China in a full-fledged war if they're flying the flags of Panama, Liberia, the Marshall Islands? I, I don't know. You know, it, it's we're seeing that issue play out in Russia, Ukraine right now. We're seeing it play out in the Red Sea right now. Uh, that's the big issue we see. All right, John, let's go ahead and get to your number one story for, for 2023. All right. The number one story is obviously the Red Sea. I'm running out of time. I don't want to dive deep into the mechanics of what's happening in the Red Sea. But I tell you, Sal, I've been doing this for 15 years and some of the, you know, the, the missteps, um, some of the micromanaging from Washington on the naval operations, some of the lack of participation in this Operation Prosperity Garden from close allies. Um, you, you know, it's some of the craziest things I have ever uh, reported on in my 15 years of G captain. So, so in the amount, the sheer amount of disconnect, um, I, I really hated to do it, but on Christmas Eve, I took six hours. I woke up at four in the morning and took six hours and wrote a very critical uh, article about our competition, uh, Lloyd's List. I, I don't believe uh, in denigrating competition. I, I think all of there are so few shipping medias that we got to work together and cure sea blindness. 
Uh, we work really hard with uh, freight waves and maritime executive and what's going around in shipping to boost everyone up. But they, the stories that they were, you know, they, they came out with this thing that, uh, you know, operation, everyone applauds operation prosperity guardian, and it's a wonderful thing. And then they all went away for Christmas. And meanwhile, this operation is falling apart. And a lot of, from what I'm hearing of it falling apart is there is a huge disconnect between uh, commercial shipping industry and the naval affairs. And, you know, this industry is very siloed. When I go to a tanker conference, I never see cruise ship guys. When I go to a cruise ship conference, I don't see Wall Street uh, shipping bankers. When I go to a Wall Street like Marine Money event, I don't see any Navy officers. The only people who are at all of these events are the Coast Guard and you know, I, I think I think they should take Thad Allen and bring him out of retirement. You know, the guy who was in charge of Deepwater Horizon and put him in charge of this operation, Prosperity Guardian, uh, because he did a wonderful job in getting uh, the oil industry and the locals and the military all on the same page. Right now, they're not on the same page. But this is only half the story, Sal. I, I don't think that's the number one story of the year. Um, I think I think that. The Navy itself is doing a pretty fabulous job here. And uh, I, I, I'm, I'm going to get a lot of surprised looks on here, Sal, because I have been one of the most critical of the Navy since of the Navy since the Fitz, Fitzgerald and McCain uh, sinking where they ran into commercial ships and fortunately sailors died. I've been beating um, the gong about uh, U.S. Navy reform and that the U.S. Navy has to work closer together with uh, Merritt. I've been being the reform that if we don't build more Navy ships and figure out problems like the LCS and cancel super ship programs like the uh, the Zumwalt and build escort frigates that we're going to be right here where we are now uh, in the Red Sea. But in the last year and unfortunately, since, I mean, almost overnight after the CNO, uh, Admiral Gill Day left and we got our new CNO, uh, Franchetti, um, the Navy has been working their butts off to really start to understand this commercial ship. We understand sea lift. Uh, so, you know, the, the Navy leads on this are, you know, the CNO figuring out what ships and equipment are needed to be protected needed to protect. And Gilday previously was the one who came out and said, no fire, we're not building, we're not supporting fireboats in uh, San Diego, even after the Bonham Richard fire. And then uh, Franchetti came in and she hasn't been very vocal, but what I hear behind the scenes, she has been supportive of that. And right after the CNO left, the secretary of the Navy did this amazing speech in Harvard uh, saying, we got to focus on shipbuilding. We got to focus on commercial. We got to focus on sea lift. We need to increase ties with the shipping community, both in the United States and overseas. Um, And at the same time, Congress, who has been absolutely asleep at the wheel, has woken up and passed a new NDAA through Representative Waltz's efforts on the House Armed Services Committee, uh, requiring a holistic uh, maritime strategy that includes both Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, and Merchant Marine, as well as shipbuilding and everything else. So, on one end, it's a this coalition and the operation seems like a disaster and it's falling apart in the Red Sea. On the other hand, look look at all the missiles the Carney's shooting down. Look at all of um, you know what um, uh, the the Eisenhower is doing now, getting overreach. Look at what the SecNav is doing behind the scenes to get money into these uh, programs uh, like icebreakers and salvage ships and merchant ships. It's it's this real uh, dichotomy. And I think a lot of the problems in the Red Sea are twofold. One, Sino Gilde only left recently, and, and this, this has only been gaining traction and speed over the last six to, to 12 months. It, it takes time. You know, it's not easy to build a ship. And number two, from what I'm hearing is, you know, the, the, the Navy leadership did not like this plan that's being really micromanaged uh, by, by the White House. And without that core naval support, not, not just the admirals and the secretary of the Navy, but the leading thinkers, you know, like our 
our friends, Brett Sadler and Jerry Hendricks and uh, Brian McGrath and these guys who are really at the think tanks, Bruce Jones, without their uh, support, it was kind of thrown in the lap of the White House and the Secretary of Defense, who, by the way, is a former army general. He doesn't understand ships. And the Navy, either by backing away themselves or by these larger organizations pushing them away, um, they've, they've been in charge of the operational, which has been going exceptionally well, but they haven't been in charge of all the political and connecting the communities, which is, which has been a disaster. No, I, I think when you look at tactically, I, I mean, the Navy is excelling exceptionally. You're right. You know, I, you and I will criticize the Navy from time to time, but then again, it's not detrimental to the Navy. We're, we're, we're trying to highlight issues that we think need to be fixed. Sea lift is the one I tend to talk talk the most about. But if you look at what the small boys are doing right now, the destroyers, the Carney, the Mason, the Laboon, the Thomas Hudner, you know, Stetham and, and, and Gravely and, and all of them that are out there right now, they're exceptionally well because the Burke class destroyer is the premier fighting warship of the day. I, I mean, they, they just are as much as we bash LCS and Zoom Walt and, and all the other crap that's out there at times, the Burke class destroyer, especially the old ones, because these are the old flight ones, these are the ones built back in the nineties are just killing it right now and they're doing exactly what you want them to do and it's great you know vice admiral brad cooper out at fifth lead in the combined maritime force is doing an exceptional job where the issue is is politics it's the political side that's creating the problems it's getting the allies online it's trying to fight a convoy battle from the west wing of the white house which you can't do you've got to allow your commanders in the field to to run things and I think that's really an exceptional. And the, and the White House is getting pressure from the shipping majors, right? It's not. Right. Right. And it's something that you and I have talked about before, that the idea that you can't, you know, it's it's not a question of talking to Denmark about Maersk. You have to talk to Maersk because Maersk is a separate entity from Denmark. They, you know, Denmark just announced that they're going to send a frigate, but it's got to get passed through parliament. And I think that's a lot of issues that we brought to the, the highlight there, that, that the fact that the largest shipping line in the world, Maersk, is getting is running two U.S. flagships through the area uh, today, you've got other ships coming through. You just had three Maersk ships come through the Suez Canal. I'm not telling you any secrets. This is out there in open source. You know, so Maersk is running ships through this region. And, you know, the, the fact that Maersk, that Denmark sent one staff officer, one, you know, I understand that Denmark has issues in the Baltic right now with Russia and everything. But again, it, it's, it's Den, you know, Maersk represents anywhere from five to 10% of the GDP of Denmark. It's, it's fairly substantial. So, you know, it, it's it's of their interest to make sure that these ships are going through. And again, we're seeing this. This is the big fundamental change we're seeing, I think, in in the shipping industry. We can get into talking about sectors. And I did that the other day with, with, with Jay on the bulk and the tankers and the container side. But the real big issue and the big variable out there, and it's the conversation you had with Lars Jensen a few years ago, is that the big variable out there is the Navy, is, 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 is what happens on the seas. Because if ships can't freely move through the oceans right now, that's going to throw things off. I just happened to look at where Ever Given is. Ever Given that stuffed up the Suez two years ago is off the west coast of Africa because it can't go through the Suez because Evergreen, it, it doesn't want to take the chance because no one wants to take a 20,000 TEU box ship through the Suez for the fear that the Houthis throw a missile at it, it hits a container, that container bursts in the flame, there's no salvage vessels in the area, and you lose you know, a half a billion dollars worth of cargo in one ship. And so you know, you take this, this voyage around, and now we're seeing companies playing strategies. MSC, Mediterranean Shipping Company, who is being targeted by the Houthi because the fact that the owner's wife is part has Israeli citizenship along with Swiss citizenship. Uh, you know, the United Eight came under uh, concentrated attack. The Laboon, a U.S. destroyer, had to come to its assistance. Uh, this is changing the way we move goods around the planet. If 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 a non-state actor like the Houthi, and that gets me a lot of trouble when I say non-state actor because it's it's a, it's a civil war in in the region. But if the Houthi can throw missiles and drones and cause twelve to fifteen percent of the world's trade to be disrupted, man, what happens when a major state player wants to do this? And what happens when you have a bad actor that does this? The Indian Navy just sent three destroyers into the Red Sea. The Indian Navy. So, you know, are the Indians going to take a role here? Because it's Indian crews that are being hit. 
You know, it was an Indian crew that was attacked by the Iranian missile that hit that tanker the other day. It's, it's part of the, uh, they're part Indians on the galaxy leader being held by the Houthi. What happens if India goes to war against the Houthi? I mean, this is, this is, this creates a lot of variables out in shipping. All right, John, we are almost out of time. We're a little bit over time. I want to get to one question if I can, because it was a question that came up quite a few times here. Uh, and actually, uh, let me get it up. That's not the question I wanted. It had to do with, here it is. So the question had to do with climate and the issue with fuel, uh, the low sulfur. We're seeing this quite a bit right now, uh, coming back in, uh, a lot of issues about that issue. And I, I will recommend to everybody to go over and take a look at the uh, maritime stories that made 2023 over in G captain. Uh, it identifies all these stories that we're talking about and a few others, so uh, be sure to go take a look at it. I'll have the link again in the show notes here for you. John, if you just want to talk about that that issue on uh, on fuel and propulsion, what you think with the IMO regulations and sustainability, because I know you just wrote a piece in the, the other day about this. Right. I, I wrote a long piece and it's very dense and difficult. And uh, this, uh, you know, this came from a question from a very senior Navy leader saying, uh, you know, how what, what are these environmental rules? How do they play into this whole red sea thing and what we're seeing and for for better or for worse um you know you have this enormous push for esg now i'm an environmentalist g captain has been writing about the environment for 15 years and for the first 10 years of g captain um uh, we got very little traction you didn't hear very many environmental uh panels or things at conferences no one really read those stories we wrote them because I thought they were important. And, and my, my wife, who worked for Scripps, a, a marine biology major, uh, she thought they were important. And they are important. But then there was, okay, the industry decides to go on board. And man, oh boy, did they jump in with both feet. Now it's wind farm this and alternative fuel that and green corridors this. And everything sounds great except when you see, you know, that the, the, the competition that's going on behind the scenes and the big structural issues um, with this whole dynamic. So we'll, we'll take the wind farms, for example. Um, you, um, you had our, our new Robert Kennedy, a presidential candidate. He fought for 20 years in New York Harbor. I know about this. Sal knows about this because we went to New York Maritime College to close down the nuclear reactor in New York and replace it with these wind turbines. And everyone in the maritime industry said they're too hard, they're too difficult. But then all of this lobbying came in a lot from China because China has the rare earth metals. They have the battery technology. They have the turbine technology to sell to us. And a huge amount of lobbying flood went into these environmental initiatives. And they were all based on this idea of zero interest rates, right? Really low cost of capital because it takes an enormous amount of money to build all of this out. Well, now we've seen starting with the port congestion, a lot of a lot of the reason the inflation hasn't gone down as much as the White House had hoped is because we they do like the Inflation Adjustment Act where they actually pour more money in, but it doesn't solve the cause of this. Look at look at the big problems. The inflation's a huge problem. Energy crisis in in Europe's a huge problem. Well, we got plenty of oil and energy. It's we don't have the ships to get it to there. This huge world food crisis. Well, there's plenty of food around the world, but there are mines in the Black Sea. Um, so a lot of these problems tie back to maritime, and people don't understand it. So you had the inf uh, Infrastructure Act, and people to check 1.2 trillion dollars with a T, Sal, but less than one percent of that money has been allocated to the ports. The port congestion crisis kind of fixed itself because ships moved to the East Coast, but the structural issues inside the ports have not been fixed. Meanwhile, these environmental role, low emission rules in California parts are reducing the number of trucks that can move containers. So if we had a crisis now, we'd be worse off. Um, my And my biggest complaint about these environmental rules is ships are 10 times more efficient uh, than than trains. Um, some people say three. Uh, Jay Mintzmeyer had a thing, 10. 
trains are 10 times more efficient than trucks. Trucks are 10 times more efficient than aircraft. Aircraft are 10 times more efficient than helicopters. And helicopters are 10 times more efficient than rockets. But where is all this money, this uh, tech bro money and the infrastructure money going in? It's going to rockets, then drones, then airplanes. So th this entire environmental thing is flipped on its head. And what the shipping companies are doing with these green corridors, Maersk is building these methanol ships, which are extremely expensive to build, which means that unless you're a shipping major, unless you're a big carrier, you can't build a methanol ship. Um, and then what they are doing is they're doing these green corridors and they're, that means that, and with this infrastructure money and the local tax money, they're getting ports like LA and Shanghai to invest in methanol delivery transfer infrastructure. The carriers aren't paying for this. The taxpayer is paying for this. And then Maersk is going to get an exclusive use of these uh, green corridors because they're the only ones biggest and CMA, CGM and MSC will follow. But the small carriers, the Deneos, the uh, uh, Navios Maritime, they can't jump this huge hurdle in construction costs. So they can't get the low price methanol and the low price taxpayer subsidized fuel. So it's, it's what would be great for the environment is if we all woke up and everyone realized that, yeah, this green corridor and it's good. It's good. The green corridor is good. I'm not against it. I'm not against the wind farm. But we need to take the subsidies away from the rockets and aviation, and we need to put it in and in, in give it to the small guys as well. It can't just be Maersk with the big pockets and lower cost of capital to build the methanol ship. It has to be the Matsons, the Zims, the uh, Deneos, these. Um, and and that's I don't see that happening right now. And it's got to be the wind farms and uh, the nuclear, right? I, I think you're right. I, I think it's, it, it's a big challenge. I mean, you're trying to make the largest object in human history, you know, zero emission. It, and it, it, it's tough. And, and I keep going back to the idea, well, we were zero emission for a long time in the maritime industry. They're called sailboats. And it, it's just a really tough proposition. I think we need to challenge it. We do need to do it. I mean, one of the big problems you have is that that emission is concentrated in ports. As you bring these large vessels into LA and Long Beach, you have a very heavy concentration of emissions in those ports. But understand, to go to like shore power is a big challenge too, because that's a lot of power you start sucking out from, from all of a sudden from shore to, to reduce those emissions. You've got to generate that power somehow. Uh, nuclear power is really interesting. I would argue the U.S. Navy doesn't even do nuclear power as efficiently as they could because you have nuclear power plants sitting in Navy docks and they're not providing power to the grid ashore. They should be because you can't turn a nuclear power really off. Uh, you can lower it down. It's still running all the time. Why are we not taking that nuclear power from a ship and feeding it into shore in Norfolk and San Diego and Pearl Harbor and other places? Uh, so I, I think we really need to be looking at it. John, I was going to end on that, but I want to add this one thing. Because uh, I want to add really quick with that, no. the biggest environmental disaster of this year. I wrote the book on the Deepwater Horizon 10 years ago, um, Fire on the Horizon is the book. The biggest environmental disaster this year is the hundreds of billions, if not trillions, depending on how long it is, uh, emission of uh cubic meters of CO2 that's going to be emitted as these ships go around Africa. And while yep. Maersk and, and MSCs and all them are pushing these green corridors, uh, what, what's really a, a green corridor is getting, getting ships through the Suez. So yep. they talk environmental all the time. And then quietly when they have to reroute, it's, it's, it doesn't make news. doesn't make headlines. There's gonna be a this, lot of, a lot of emissions raining down on Africa Biden administration and Pete Buttigieg, who's been pushing all this environmental, he should be the number one guy standing up and saying, the Suez is the greatest corridor that saved more emissions than any other, uh, construction project in history, right? It, it is. It, the less sailing you do, obviously, He's the quiet. more efficient. The more efficient. And again, you're going to get more emissions and carbon raining down on, on Africa, on the west and south shore of Africa than ever before. This last question uh, by Roxby, which I think is a really important one, because uh, you've talked about this a lot, the Midshipman X scandal from uh, both you and I, we talked about this, you know, two years later, any meaningful reforms or improvements? For those of you who don't know, Midshipman X 
was a midshipman by the name of Hope Hicks. She identified herself. I'm not letting, I'm not putting that name out there. Uh, but she was uh, a victim of sexual assault and harassment while doing a cadet cruise on a vessel uh, by uh, a senior officer. And she came out and vocally uh, talked about this. And then others came out about it. And so there was a big issue about sexual assault, sexual harassment across not just in, in the maritime industry, but in maritime colleges, in all aspects of the maritime. And we're talking U.S. here, but it's, it's international because it's probably worse in some registries around the world. So, John, uh, any uh, meaningful reform or improvement you would say that's happened regarding uh, sexual assault? sexual harassment coming out of the midshipman X scandal. And, and it is worse uh, as Ian Urbina, who's been, you know, documenting the, the fishing fleet there, there is a huge amount of slavery and sexual assault on uh, the, the Chinese fishing fleet, according to him, the New York times journalist, you got to read his thing. But I mean, this, this is a big topic. It's really close to, to my heart. My, my wife wa was a, uh, you know, went to maritime college, was a ship's officer. Uh, a lot of her friends are out there. It's, it's a huge, huge deal. Last year, Sal, we ended with predictions, the most influential bodies or the things to really watch in 2023. I think you said the maritime administration and I said the international maritime organization, the UN body in London. Now the maritime administration has been working with the Senate. They have a new act out, uh, they're doing a lot of good work behind the scenes. Um, and a lo lot of these women are coming out and there's a lot more um, people getting prosecuted. But we see CGIS is not following through. Uh, NCIS, we've had uh, assaults, straight up rapes uh, on uh, military sealift command ships. NCIS has dropped the ball on them. They've given it to the FBI. The FBI is not interested in maritime actions. And you know, our maritime administrator, um, Admiral Phillips, she's doing a great job. When I go to Marin meetings, I talk to it. I mean, she is consumed and, uh, you know, really working hard with Congress on it, but it's the Congress already understands this problem. Uh, what this needs is a larger audience. And I wrote an article saying that, that, you know, the, the nickname I'm hearing, uh, in back halls is that the Marin administrator is the ghost admiral. It, it, this was, because she's not engaging the media. She's not getting on YouTube. She's not getting the audience. So if, if Congress passes a law in a back room and it gets stuck in an NDAA or something and ship owners kind of putting cameras, that's one thing. But what these women need is support. And what we need is arrests. There needs to be pressure on NCIS, FBI to make arrests. And I know it's difficult, but there have been Dozens, probably hundreds of assaults and straight up rapes over the last 20 years. You can't arrest one person. Um, and B B Buttigieg, again, is silent about this. He has 3 million followers in the Merchant Marine Academy, despite all this major scandal, only has 3,000 followers on Twitter because he's not retweeting and bringing this issue. And then that was your side with the Marit. Uh, my side was the International Maritime Organization. With the head of that, uh, the administrative branch was a three-star admiral, and the head of the IMO was a, a Korean, South Korean national. Uh, that's been the leadership has been taken over by Panama, which we know has very deep connections with China, and they've completely dropped the ball. One thing Pete did do was go to IMO and beg them to pass international laws. At almost every single single step they have dragged their feet on protecting women at sea and um right after the panama took thing the the, the coast guard admiral admiral kenny's contract was not renewed uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of shitty business happening with the imo but a lot of inaction and even where there's action like i said admiral phillips is doing a great job there's a real reluctance to publicize this and get the words out on how these women could protect themselves and, and, and make straight up arrests, right. To send a message. Yeah. I, I think that was the issue I raised when I was asked about what I thought was going on is like, you know, they're not seeing any action. Uh, and when you go back and look at the past 10 years, what has been prosecuted, what has been done, it was very little. And now, you know, Merit has the embark program where they're acquiring systems in place, so that, uh, you know, if you're embarked on a ship, you have a system to report 
Uh, it, it's a very, I, I mean, you know, to be a, a merchant marine cadet on a vessel and to have your senior officer who has keys to your room be able to come in at any moment, you can't even sleep at night uh, knowing that you're, you, you, you know, somebody can be in your room in a second. And this is the person, by the way, who's going to be writing your fitness evaluation for the potential for you to get a job later on. So th this is this. And again, and it's not like you can even go home at night and feel safe because you're living on the ship 24 seven and you're on there for months at a time. And so this this is this is a, a really terrible position. I mean, I'm so glad you have a bigger problem really quick. Right. So what we didn't mention is the U S flagship sitting for what was seven, eight days without Navy escort in the red sea uh, last week, kind of forgotten about. And you and I push for that. You, you see um, a, a tanker going into Israel, getting missiles thrown at it from our Moss. Luckily the iron dome came, but this, this hot shrapnel going down on a tanker and there was no Navy escort. There was no, there was no news. Now you have a uh, hope Hicks. I mean, if you do one thing, call up Marad and say, why hasn't she gotten a medal? I mean, she has gone through enormous personal pressure and just the, the moral bravery of her stepping forward and saying, yep. I'm not going to do this. Marad has medals. Military seal of him has medals. I want to see medals for these guys. I want to see recognition. I want to see reintroduction of veteran status because guys are already voting with their feet with the Red Sea. There were individuals who quit uh, OSG, the tanker company, over comments of bringing in foreign mariners. They don't feel protected. They're frustrated. They're leaving. We have this huge mariner shortage, and these are just Houthis. What, what happens when we have a large war in the Pacific? Yep. Why would mariners jump in if you don't? recognize them and issuing a few medals and retweeting from Pete and stepping up and saying, we support them. I mean, this, this ghost Admiralty and I don't know what Pete is just sleep at the wheel. He just zero interest in maritime. And I am not talking about sexual assault. That's why I love your channel. And I <clears> love <throat> being here because you, you got 150,000 followers, Sal, and you're well, getting the message, but it's not your job. It's the Navy's and Maritime Administration. Well, and, and again, one of the things that I know I try to do, and I know you do the same thing, is try to raise these issues. And sometimes it seems like we're hopping and we're, we're, we're picking on people. And, you know, there's John and Sal, you know, saying these bad things again. But, you know, again, you know, good news is great. I love talking about good news and I do talk about good news. I love when we have an opportunity to hit the positives and I try to do it as much as I can. But at the same time, too, you got to raise the bad. And, and, and that's the only way to get things fixed. And, you know, when, as you mentioned, the ship sitting there for seven days in the Red Sea, that's a problem. You can't, you know, when you sit there and high five that you escorted the ship through, that's great. But when the ship sat there for seven days waiting for the escort, that that's the, the fundamental problem. It took a while to get it fixed. Same thing. Just because you create a system now that protects females on vessels, that's great. We should all, you know, feel good about that. But let's not forget that the situation isn't fixed, that Ian or Bina piece about slavery on Chinese fishing vessels is powerful. I mean, it's just Ian or being a just amazing. I don't know how he does what he does, but his pieces are just absolutely essential reading to understand what's going on out there. And I, I think it's, it's really important. John, we went over our time. I knew we would, but that's okay. I want to appreciate, I want to say how much I appreciate you coming on again and talking to us, bringing your top five stories for the past year. Again, I go back to March 24th, I think it was, of, of 2021, when we did our first episode together, where we talked about Ever Given in the Suez. Uh, you have given me the opportunity to write for G-Captain, which I appreciate. You you put my name forward to talk about this on BBC and, and really was instrumental in me launching this YouTube channel. So I will, you always have an open invite to come on. For, for those who don't know, I pushed him for years to, to, to get on this YouTube because you're, you're <laughs> fabulous, Sal. And uh, not just here, but on your Patreon group too. And I'm no. looking at our G captain subscribers. We, we picked up a hundred new subscribers just now. Thanks to you. So we're at 99,902. So 98 more. Let's well, I uh, listen, we're gonna I, hit that hundred K and uh, come after your what? 150, 170. 170, right? <laughs> 170. Listen, I appreciate everybody. It's been great to have you on. John, thank you so much for being here. Take a moment, head on over to the G Captain, sign up for the newsletter, go take a look through the forum. They're a great site. I recommend all the news sites, but John is the one I go to all the time. For everybody who tuned in over, we had 
over 500 people here. We've got 500 people on right now. Uh, I want to thank everybody for tuning in, everyone who likes and subscribes. Thank you so much. Uh, leave comments. Uh, feel free. Go back in, watch it again. Leave some comments. If we didn't get a chance to get to your question, I apologize. But we will be doing this again. Had a lot of positive uh, uh, notes from the live feed I did the other day. Probably try to do some more of those in the future. New year coming on. A lot going on still with shipping across the board. We're seeing shipping shift over to the West Coast. We've got the issue in the Panama Canal, which we didn't even get a chance to talk to talk about. Uh, we're, we're seeing uh, freight rates start escalating up again. Uh, there, there's a lot to look forward to going in 2024. So, you know, keep your eye on the seas, watch the choke points, as our buddy Ross always likes to say, and tune in to both what's going on with shipping and G-Captain. John, thank you so much. And to everybody, thanks for tuning in. Thank you, Sal.